In Lecture SA19, Work Energy Principle was introduced and its application for calculating truss displacements was illustrated. In this lecture, I'm going to examine the use of this principle for calculating deflections in beams and frames. Make sure you have reviewed the previous discussion before continuing with this lecture. According to Work Energy Principle, work done by applied loads equals to the change in the internal energy of the structure. Assuming that the unloaded structure has zero stored energy, we can write external work equals to internal energy. In the case of a beam subjected to a concentrated load P, external work equals to one half P times delta, where delta is the vertical displacement under the load. Let's see how we can come up with a mathematical expression for internal energy for this beam. Imagine the beam is divided into small elements, each carrying an internal bending moment like this. Each element undergoes a small amount of deformation caused by the internal bending moment. Let's refer to this deformation as d theta. We can write the internal energy stored in the element as one half m times d theta. If we sum up the internal energies in all the beam elements, we get the total internal energy. For the sake of accuracy and convenience, we generally perform this summation via integration. That is, total internal energy in the beam is one half times the integral of m d theta. Let's see how we can evaluate this expression. I know how to write m in terms of x since m is the moment equation for the beam. Here is the moment equation for a beam of length l subjected to a concentrated load p at midspan. So I can write the beam's internal energy as since m is defined in terms of x, before I can integrate this expression, d theta must be replaced with dx. But what is dx and how is it related to d theta? Here is a beam element before deformation. We refer to the length of this infinitesimal element as dx. Here it is after the deformation. Note how the top part of the element is compressed or shortened and the bottom part elongated. Since we are going from compression to tension, there must be a plane between the top and the bottom fibers that remains undeformed. In two-dimensional drawings, we refer to this plane as neutral axis. What is the length of the beam segment along the neutral axis? Given that this length does not change as the beam deforms, it must be dx. Now we can write dx in terms of d theta. From basic geometry, we know that an arc length of a circle equals to the radius of the circle times the angle facing the arc length. Here the arc length is dx, the angle facing it is d theta, and the radius of the circle is r. So we can write dx equals r d theta. Note that r is inversely proportional to m. As m increases, r decreases, and vice versa. Not surprisingly, the product of m and r is constant. For linear elastic material, this constant can be expressed in terms of modulus of elasticity of the material and moment of inertia of the beam segment about the axis of bending. More specifically, we can write m times r equals e times i, where e is modulus of elasticity and i is the moment of inertia. Since dx equals r d theta, we can write d theta equals dx over r. 
and since m times r equals ei, we can write 1 over r equals m over ei. Then d theta equals m over ei dx. Now we can write For our simply supported beam, we can write Assuming a constant EI for the beam, we can write or Therefore, the expression for the work energy principle becomes We can use this equation to determine delta. Let's wrap up our discussion on the work energy principle by examining its use for determining the deflection of a frame subjected to a concentrated load. The expression for external work is rather easy to obtain. It is 1 half P times delta. The frame consists of three members. We need to calculate the internal energy stored in each member. To do so, first we need to analyze the structure and calculate its internal member forces. We start by applying the equilibrium equations to the entire structure. Here is the system's free body diagram. There are three unknown support reactions. We can calculate them very easily. Now we are ready to calculate member forces. Let's start with member AC. We know the forces at A. So, we can apply the equilibrium equations to the entire member in order to determine the forces at C. That is, for AC, some of the forces in the X direction must be zero. Some of the forces in the Y direction must be zero. Some of the bending moments about, say, point A, must be zero. So we get... Now, draw joint C and balance the forces at the joint. We know the forces at the column end. The forces at the beam end are opposite to those at the column end. These also balance the forces at the left end of member CD. So the free body diagram for member CD looks like this. Next, we examine joint D. Here is the free body diagram for the joint. The forces are balanced, so we can move on. Lastly, here is the free body diagram for member BD. The member carries only an axial load. Now that we know all the member forces, we can calculate the internal energy for each member. Let's start with member BD. The member is subjected to an axial force only. Therefore, the member's internal energy can be written as the axial force in the member is negative 2P. We use Hooke's law to determine the member's axial deformation. See lecture SA19 for details. The internal energy stored in BD is Next, we examine member AC. The member is subjected to three internal forces, an axial force, a bending moment, and a shear force. Each force causes a unique deformation and therefore contributes to the total internal energy of the member.
The axial force causes axial deformation, the bending moment causes rotational deformation, and the shear force causes shear deformation. So, the internal energy of the member can be written as the sum of three terms. However, shear deformation in beams is generally negligible. Therefore, let's omit the last term. For the axial case, we basically repeat what we did for member BD. To determine the internal energy due to bending, we need to write the member's moment equation. So the internal energy due to bending can be written as, therefore the total internal energy stored in member AC is, finally, we consider member CD. Like AC, this member carries an axial load, a bending moment, and a shear force. Ignoring the shear deformation, the internal energy in the member can be written as the sum of two terms, internal energy due to axial force and internal energy due to bending. For the axial force we have for bending we have This gives a total internal energy for member CD. Now we can write the structure's internal energy as the sum of the member internal energies. By the way, this portion of the internal energy is due to axial deformation and this portion is due to bending. The equation for the work energy principle can now be written as Solving for delta, we get the horizontal displacement under the applied load. In this lecture and the previous one, we saw how the work energy equation can be used to calculate displacement in trusses, beams, and frames. This application of the work energy principle, however, has limited use. Do you know why? Do you see the limitation? Here is a beam subjected to a concentrated load. The work energy equation for this beam is, assuming that we can determine the internal energy, the equation can be used to calculate delta. This is so because delta appears in the expression for external work. If the displacement that we seek to determine does not appear in the external work expression, it cannot be calculated using the work energy equation. For example, vertical displacement at B does not contribute to the external work here, so it does not appear in the work energy equation. Therefore, it cannot be calculated using the equation. 
Here's another example. The work energy equation for this beam is one half times P delta plus Q delta star equals to the internal energy. Here the displacement at B does appear in the work energy equation, but still we cannot calculate it. Why? Because the equation has two unknowns, delta and delta star. We cannot solve for two unknowns using one equation only. Simply put, the work energy equation can only be used to determine the displacement under an applied concentrated load in the direction of the load when no other applied loads are present. Although this technique has limited practical use, the work energy principle is a basis for more general energy methods. We will study one or two such methods in future lectures.